right, let's let's start. Um, uh, thanks, thanks for the invitation to, to give this lecture. I've been to St. Petersburg once about 10 years ago. That I met my current wife here, so it's always nice to come back here. Um, you. Yeah. The, um, I may have had a slight food poisoning, you know, so if I'm uh, even less uh, coherent than normal, so please apologize for, for that. So I, I just try to, to survive. And uh, I went to the restaurant, ordered the most fantastic carpaccio Argentinian beef, and, and it was so good. And then in the morning, you know, uh, put me off. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to describe briefly a model of speech perception to sort of set the scene for audiovisual speech perception. I'm going to mostly focus on the role of attention in uh, audiovisual speech perception, basically two aspects of attention. Perceptual set, which is about what we expect to, to hear or to perceive, seems to affect the integration process. How we put together uh, visual and auditory stimuli. Probably very automatically. The other one is selective attention. When you focus your attention on some aspect of the stimulus or the stimulus, if you consider that as an object, seems to also affect the integration process. It means that if you're not paying attention to the articulatory movements, then the auditory stimulus and what you see, they don't combine into one uh, uh, sound or syllable. I tried to show a few, uh, a few demonstrations and, and hope that I can convince you that that's the way. And, and the motto for all this is that Perception and attention are closely linked, and human beings are active perceivers. They are not like passive receivers of stimuli, but they actively seek information from the environment. Okay. Now, I'm not, you probably cannot see, but this is from Hickok and Peppel from 2007. They've described a model of speech perception which actually combines the auditory cortex and the frontal areas which are, uh, which are reserved for, for speech production. And we know now that while we're listening to something and depending on a task, our motor system is activated. And while we speak, the motor system sends a signal to the auditory Parts. In most cases, uh, to attenuate while we're actually uh, speaking our own perceptual system, at least to some extent. The interesting bit about this dual root model is that it, um, it suggests that there are two ways of combining the auditory system to the motor system. One is the so called uh, dorsal root which uh, starts from the superior marginal gyrus, at least the back up there, and is connected to the uh, premotor cortex and what is usually uh, called the progress area. And this is just the sensory motor link. That's, where, that's the way the, the motor cortex and the auditory cortex uh, talk to each other. This ventral route is more related to dealing with meaning and intelligible speech. There are a couple of nice papers by, by Stuart Rosen and, and Sophie Scott who manipulated the intelligibility of, of speech and showed that these areas here, the medial temporal uh, gyrus and the anterior temporal uh, uh, areas are activated to a different degree as a function of how intelligible the speech is. You can do it by adding noise, noise for coding, normal natural speech and creating like a type, type uh, speech 
and people can still understand the phonetic content. What I'm going to do today is um, show you how to use sine wave vocoded speech, which is an artificial way of uh, preserving information about speech, the vocal tract resonances, the timing, the amplitude modulation, and people can understand uh, sine wave speech if they know to expect that in speech. If they are naive, nobody's told them that the, the weird sounding stimuli actually are speech. They don't perceive them, the, 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 don't recognize the syllables, the sounds. That's a very uh, persuasive way of, of uh, taking care of the stimulus properties. You know, one of the research questions is that is speech perceived uh, uh, in a different uh, way from other sounds? Or are they, uh, are they using the same kind of mechanisms in terms of speech perception? Now, there's always a problem comparing speech to non-speech sounds. Because non-speech uh, sounds usually are less complex than speech. But using uh, some sort of uh, manipulation like time, uh, time varying uh, sine wave speech signals or these noise recorded things, you can use the identical stimulus and compare how they are processed depending on the expectation of the, of the, uh, the participants. Okay. <coughs> right. Audiovisual speech perception. At the moment, you're looking at my face, unless uh, you're sleeping, but you can also see my, uh, my mood, uh, mouth movements and you hear my voice, and you combine that into one percent. You actually do hear my mouth movements. Uh, and what happens is that when you see the articulatory movements, it enhances speech perception, especially in noisy conditions, but also in quiet. People are more accurate in recognizing speech when they see it. That's, that's a fact. Now, you probably all heard about this McGurk-McDonald uh, effect, McGurk effect, where you combine two stimuli which are incongruent. You see different things than what you hear, and it creates an illusion, an auditory illusion, which is very, uh, very uh, prominent and persuasive. Let's try to see if I can show you. Just report what you hear. Uh, what did you hear? Okay, now close your eyes. What do we hear now? Aba. Aba, right? So, incongruent information. When you look at the articulatory movements, you actually do hear Ada or Aba. I hear it as Ada. I don't know why. And it's not the fruit poison. Because because I've done this earlier. Okay. Right. So, now the question is, how does that integration process take, uh, take place? There are two major theories or models. One is that you combine the visual and auditory information very automatically without identifying both sources. So the identification process takes place on these visual and auditory stimuli are combined, integrated. Now, the other people claim that it happens late. You first process the auditory stimulus and you, the, the system says that's bar. And you process the visual, the articulatory movements and you say ga. And then the system combines those into a new person. So those are the two main possibilities. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about the actual integration process much, except that I try to show that 
the tension of uh, the tension modulates the integration process. Especially your expectations can hinder the integration process. Even, even if you're looking at the face, but you're not uh, paying attention to the mouth. You're doing, for example, another visual uh, uh, detection task. The mouth movements are right at the sharp area of, of vision. And you still report only the thing that comes out of the, the, the loudspeakers. So the integration is hindered in, in many cases. Uh, and we don't know whether attention works at the early stage prevents the extraction of the visual features or at the late stage. That's my suggestion is, and it's a, it's a guess that it works at the, at the late stage. Because there are some reports which suggest that even if you're not really focusing your attention to the mouth, the mouth movements, the visual features, say, are guard, your mouth is wider than our bar. Those kinds of basic features are extracted, but they, they're not enough to be uh, combined into an a auditory illusion. Okay, now, I hope this isn't like uh, too basic, but uh, you know, what's attention for? Which you all know about this, right? You perceive what you expect, more or less. Uh, attention, attention or perceptual set is one way of setting and sticking to your goals. Um, I have, um, I think this is revealing to some extent. About five years ago, I wanted a motorcycle van. And I thought that I had money, I just moved to London, and I thought, okay, I'm going to buy a motorcycle from London because they are cheaper, they are newer, and, and I like the a couple of the, uh, the, the UK uh, bikes, for example, Triumph, and then they have a lot of Ducatis. But before I had this go, I couldn't recall that I've seen so many Triumphs or you know, Ducatis on the road. But once I set my mind to finding a nice Ducati, I thought, okay, I'm seeing Ducatis all over the place. As if my mental set had primed me to pay attention to certain types of uh, bikes, they make a distinctive sound too, so it's easy to spot a Ducati. Uh, and so that's one way to think about attentional or perceptual set. It primes you towards certain stimulus features. Now, to cut a long story short, I never bought a motorcycle, and now I'm getting too old, so I'm probably going to just kill me if I ride a motorcycle. Anyway, making sense of, of the world, selective attention, basically, you just have to focus on one part of the world, otherwise it's just chaos. Selective visual attention, that's what, what I've been manipulating in my, my, uh, in my experiments and uh, look at how that affects audiovisual speech perception. Okay, and then divided attention, doing more than one thing at a time. A good example is that you can drive a car and have a conversation Nowadays, it's forbidden to, to use the, the cell phone. So, in many cases, you can do that, but in the, having two tasks at the same time does uh, affect your performance. You may not notice a pedestrian uh, at the crossing. So, my advice is to just focus on driving. Okay, let's go over there. Perceptual set. This is another example. What do you see in this picture? <coughs> Just black and white random dots. What if I say there's a dog? A dog. A Dalmatian. Dalmatian dog. 
Now I'm timing your system to find features of dog. And it's here. Snout over there, tail, hind legs, front leg. Can you, you start to see it now. Right here. Now the perceptual set uh, affects the way you organize this scene. And we can do the same thing in speech perception and audiovisual speech perception and look at where the perceptual set affects the integration process. Now, uh, we use sine wave speech and in one condition we test uh, the participants in, uh, in a condition where they don't know or where, where they expect not to hear uh, speech sounds and look whether the scene articulatory uh, movements affect the integration process. What we did was after those couple of uh, uh, experiments where we didn't tell the subjects that that was speech, we could then uh, you know, actually uh, teach them to hear the exactly the same sounds as speech and then look at whether the scene articulatory movements affect the, uh, the integration process. Okay. Uh, okay, let's do this first. Can you hear the difference between these two sounds? Do you hear? Who, who doesn't hear a difference? Everybody hears a difference, but it's it's kind of hard. How would you describe these sounds? How do you how do they sound to you? Some sort of whistles going up and down, right? Okay. Let's try this one. Um, See that the mouth movements are synchronized with with this frequency stuff. Can you? sentence I made about 10 years ago and there's uh, 
a researcher called Robert Bremers in, uh, in New York, who actually invented the whole thing, sort of made it public, 81. And I, I was worried about the, the quality of this, uh, this sentence and the whole sin... Uh, okay, uh, I sent that sentence to him and he replied to me uh, quite soon and said, okay, sounds great, the sentence, my, uh, my ship is full of eels, comes out loud and clear. Now, I think he was pulling my leg. This is not my ship is full of eels. It's life sucks and then you die. <laughs> so. Right. Now you know you're crying and then it's kind of clear that it has a phonetic content. It consists of a few words and it sounds weird, but the, this information does contain enough uh, these tracks the black and white part of that, that's the, uh, the frequency information that goes up and down, this is time, and the darker the, the track, the more intense, intense it is. And you just put these three together, and you get a nice phonetic perception. Uh, okay, now let's look at, this is the original spectrogram, of onso and this is onso. This dark vertical striation, that's the vocal uh, vocal cord pulsation. Uh, and then what you can do is you can just extract a few uh, vocal tract resonance and model their frequency uh, and their amplitude uh, values and then you put the, these separate bits together. This is the first formant, the, fir the lowest track. That's onso. Pretty much the same. Oops. That's the second. Just whistles. And this is the third one, the highest. Light bird whistle. Then you put them together. And then the phonetic stuff just jumps out, and you perceive these as, as a combination, uh, a two syllabic Finnish non word. Okay. Now, this is just a flow diagram of what we actually did with the, with the students, and I think it worked out fine. There was one student. An engineering student who was who really knew about uh, McGurk effect, and when he did the first uh, phase and didn't know that the sine wave speech was speech, and looked at the phase and did the whole experiment and came out from the booth, the testing booth, and said, "Yes, nice, but did you expect me to integrate anything?" And we said, "No." Because you didn't understand that the you know the auditory stimuli were speech, and then we told him what the actual stimuli were, and he went into the booth, did it in speech mode, the same experiment, exactly the same stimuli, and he came out smiling and said, "Okay, this is good. It seems to be working." So, so that's that's the results. This is the auditory only condition, when they just listen to the, to the uh, sine wave speech stimuli and categorize them as A or B in non-speech mode or onso and onso. The performance is about like 90 to 93 percent correct auditory responses. This is just the, the height of the bar actually suggests that the, the higher it is, the more auditory stimuli you report. The ones that come out from, from the, from the loudspeaker. And when it gets lower, then it means that you don't hear what the loudspeakers say, but you're influenced by the, by the visual information. Now, this is a congruent condition where auditory onso is combined with the visual onso, so congruent. 
and or own auditory onso with on, uh, onso, visual onso. And now these are the McGurk trials where incongruent information is combined. And this is the bar, 84% auditory responses when these guys don't know that it's speech. They just think it's whistles. The visual information doesn't uh, affect their performance. Now, the same guys when you've revealed that it's speech, and this is natural speech, only 3% of uh, auditory responses. And believe me or not, this difference here between speech mode and non-speech mode, it's not significant. We had uh, one person who couldn't hear the, uh, the uh, sign of speech as speech, even uh, after when we tried to, to, to teach her. Okay, now this is such a huge difference that you don't need statistics. But the journals, they require uh, running uh, some statistical tests, and of course, this difference and this difference are highly significant. Okay, I think this is a nice demonstration about how perceptual set, your expectations, affects how you combine visual and auditory information in speech. Now, that's just the control uh, study. Uh, okay, where in the brain does this integration take place? This is a very simplified picture which just highlights one area in the brain in the posterior superior solids. That's just uh, uh, a bit back uh, uh, from, uh, from the primary auditory cortex. Right. And it lights up when here are three different conditions sine wave speech control uh, sound, which is just noise, and then the audiovisual condition. And you can see that pre-training, almost every, you know, this activation or this signal change is approximately the same in three conditions, measured at this uh, area approximately. And then this is post-training. Now people listen to auditory only stimuli and they know that it's speech, onso or onso. And this is the audiovisual condition. And you can see that the bars here, the activation change, is exactly the same for uh, unimodal stimuli and uh, audiovisual stimuli. So this area is sensitive to the speech mode, both in unimodal when you listen to auditory stimuli only and in the audiovisual condition. But this area is lights up almost every time you use some sort of meaningful uh, stimuli. It lights up to environmental sounds, lights up to uh, words, uh, speech and audiovisual speech too. But it just tells you that this is some sort of integration uh, place, integration location, which combines uh, information coming from, uh, from many different uh, perceptual areas, visual, auditory, tactile. I haven't seen any test uh, experiments, but I'm sure not someone has, uh, has done it. Okay, now, the task, what we thought that, okay, this integration process and being in speech mode, knowing that it's speech, could be task related. What we asked people to do in the previous experiment was to identify, categorize. They have to process them deeply to, to be able to, to pick up the information and categorize onso and onso correctly or in the non-speech mode, say, okay, this uh, uh, signal was uh, category A, or belongs to category A, and this one belongs to category B. So that's identification. Now what we did was use a detection task, but with exactly the same stimuli. 
And the detection task doesn't require information about the category identity. You just have to inform whether you heard something or didn't hear something. And people have shown that usually uh, audiovisual presentation boosts up the, de uh, the detection rate a bit. Usually it's like something like less than 2 dB. It's a very small change, but it's significant. Now, what we did was uh, we ran the same uh, uh, task first with the using sine wave speech and identification, and then the other one exactly identical stimuli but using a detection task. Okay, uh, I'll just uh, mention this one. Let's. Let's look at that one. Basically, you presented um, two stimuli, trial A and trial B, and your task is only to inform whether the stimulus was present at a trial one or trial two. So, two alternative for fourth choice task. And we did it uh, with the staircase method. We were looking at the threshold or hearing threshold, how low the sound can be in terms of intensity in the presence of noise. And how and that staircase is that if you get it right, the noise level is increased. If you get it wrong, the noise level is, is uh, reduced. And you go down, up and down and up and down until you get 10 uh, incorrectly. And then we can determine the, the threshold. And you can do the same thing when the subjects know that it's speech, or we always start uh, with the, with the non-speech mode. Because if you tell them that it's speech, then they can go back to, to the non-speech mode. Right? When we didn't tell them that it's speech, and we told them that, that when we told them that it's speech, and compared the detection uh, thresholds, and there's also an auditory only condition, okay? And now, the results replicate first the, the, the previous results, which, and now, nowadays I believe that replication is, is the only way to protect from people actually working on for Let's continue. Okay, uh, <clears throat> now, like I said, select attention is there for us to make sense of the world. You know, there are a huge amount of uh, visual features. Think about visual perception. Like when I look at the, uh, the chairs and people over there, and you know, like a huge amount of information bombarding our senses all the time. So in order not to go crazy, the, uh, your system has to tune into something. Selectively focus certain, uh, to, uh, certain features and then bind those features to objects, visual objects or auditory objects. Uh, now it looks like that uh, attention in terms of perception and perceptual learning is some sort of game control. If you're focusing on something, then the, those cells in the perceptual areas, their activation thresholds, the, the thresholds for activation get lowered, and those cells which are not important for, for, uh, for per perceiving those particular things, they, their activity is inhibit, inhibited. So that it's like a game control, increasing the, the uh, the thresholds, uh, sorry, for uh, in, uh, reducing the thresholds for active cells, important cells, and inhibiting uh, the other cells. Okay, now um, I don't have uh, a net connection here, right? Internet, no. Okay. Uh, you probably know the gorilla video. Yep. Okay. I have an auditory gorilla version, which would just uh, run as a, as a student project in, in 
UCL, and this is now the scenario is this. Now you probably those who don't know about this gorilla business, then uh, you may be you might go along with the with the idea. But in the uh, in the visual version, there are two basketball teams, white team and the. The black team both consist of, uh, of three persons. And what they are doing, they have, both team has a ball, and they are throwing the ball, passing the ball to each other. White people uh, throw it to, to uh, white people, and the black people to black people, black team, okay? And the task of the, uh, the participant is to focus on the black team, uh, the, the white team, and count how many passes. Uh, they do, and explicitly ignore the black team. And at some point, a black gorilla, or someone dressed up as a as a gorilla, walks to the scene right in the center and does this, bangs the chest, and over half of the people who are watching the video don't notice the gorilla. They notice it when they are asked to to uh, have an, have another look. Now, this one is an auditory version. I have two people there, a male and a female. And the female is reading a list of random words, verbs and nouns and all kinds of things. But every once in a while, pronounces a name of a fruit or a vegetable. The male person reads another list of random words Words and nouns, but every once in a while says a name of a musical instrument. Now your task is to just try to listen to the to the female and count how many fruit and veggie names she pronounces. She reads quite fast. She has a slight German accent, which may make the the, uh, the task a bit uh, a bit difficult. But focus on the female. Count the, name, uh, the number of fruits and veggies and ignore the men. Okay. This is done in stereo. And if you listen to it in uh, using head headphones, you really hear it them walking around the room. We did it with, you know, we needed a dummy head. That was me. And we just uh, taped the microphones into my ears and, and then. Uh, stood there while they were moving around and, and reading the lists. And it really creates a 3D uh, auditory image or scene. And it's kind of nice to, to, to listen to. Okay, now let's try... Approximately 
I can't say six, but I probably missed quite many which I suppose I'm it's really ten. Ten. How many? Ten. Ten. There were sixteen. Oh. Wow. Does it count? I mean, not scarcity of seeds like that. Yeah. No. Some, some, you know, what? Like lime, date, and all those things. But let's say 15. 10 is a, is a sort of good guess. Now, the next question is Did you hear anything unusual? A clap? Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Now, let's re listen this. Um, yeah. Let's hope this starts. Yeah. Re listen and just try to detect something unusual. Synchronize those. 
So the motor system is serial, the perceptual system is sort of parallel. And now the question arises, does the tensional uh, system already affect the perceptual? The sort of, um, sort of, um, no, I'll skip that one. The sort of um, processing of perceptual elements, or does the attentional system affect the motor process, the selection, uh, selection of responses? And those are the two extremes. Um, now, all this started, you know, uh, in the 50s. Uh, Cherry worked in London in, in the uh, Imperial College and devised this, uh, this dichotic listening and shadowing task. So two different streams of, of, of stimuli are played to, uh, through headphones and the task of the participant is to just focus on one ear and repeat back, shadow, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what you hear and then later on Questions are asked, what was going on, the ignored here. And then uh, Donald Brokebent came up with the, with the model, the early selection model, because it looked like that people only could report that, yes, the, uh, the speaker on the ignored ear actually was changed to music. Uh, to music or the uh, pitch change or female, but sometimes people didn't even notice the, uh, notice that the language had been changed from English to France or some other thing, if they were paying attention to the other thing. Now, physical uh, uh, changes were noted, but not, uh, you know, the meaning of message. That suggests that there's a perceptual filter you just focus on one ear, ignore the other one. The, the system doesn't process up to the meaning, the stimuli that uh, play back on the, on the uh, ignored ear. Okay? Now this is Broadbent's early selection model. So attention is a sort of filter that just uh, pulls away uh, irrelevant stimuli and only focuses on relevant stimuli. Uh, okay, now so far so good. Now, uh, the cocktail party uh, example is really a good one. You're having a conversation here with someone else, there's a lot of uh, background noise, people are, are ch uh, chatting with each other, and then you're kind of focusing your attention uh, on, on something else, and then someone says something and it attracts your attention. You hear your name and click. You forget about what the other one is saying and, and orient towards the other source. Although you're paying attention originally to the speaker in front of you. So sometimes some information sort of goes through the, uh, the filter or some other uh, system and you sort of automatically orient to, to, towards that. The other one is, you know, you all know Stroop effect, right? So, uh, just this is the easy one. If you name the color, so that's red, green, blue, the color of the letters, okay? Blue, yellow, pink, orange, blue, green, and so forth, because it's already written there. But if I make a conflict here, this is green, blue, uh, orange, uh, that, that's blue, and so forth. If you try to do that, there's a conflict between the meaning of the word and your task. Now, this could be taken that you automatically process the meanings of those words up to the semantic level, you know, like a late selection. And it interferes with the original task. Now, the Stroop effect probably reflects response uh, competition. Uh, in a sense, you, you're kind of preparing to name the, the color of the ink for this one, 
and the previous response actually is act still active there and they are competing for, for responses and that slows you down and sometimes you make mistakes but it's like a, a distractor in a sense okay uh, now this is, this is that's the breakthrough of the unattended channel and Triesman and late selection model by Deutsch and Deutsch which suggests that everything, the system just, you know, system just processes everything and then the actual attention thing uh, happens here for response selection. Okay, remember those two extremes, the early selection and late selection model, and that's a kind of filter attenuation, attenuation model where, you know, it's not completely blocked, the ignored stigma, but their processing is attenuated. So sometimes some of these are still available for the perceiver at, at later stages. Okay, now here's a potential reconciliation. Nili Mami's perceptual load. Now, I think this is, this is a good um, sort of um, idea how it might take place. What if the perceptual system is actually capable of processing all stimuli automatically up to recognition until the system runs out of resource capacity? If the task is really difficult, you can only concentrate on one thing and probably there are not enough uh, resources to process them. But it depends on the task. And what Lavi suggests that it's not really the task difficulty, but it's how much loading of your perceptual system is in the visual display. Let's talk about visual uh, spatial attention. So low load, low uh, perceptual load condition, there are lots of information uh, resources to process many different sources of information. But once the perceptual load is increased in your primary task, then the system runs out of resources and you have to focus on that particular task very carefully and you ignore the rest. Now, how people actually... Um, let's just go through. What people usually do is a so-called flanker task. You have a, a simple visual display or a more complex where discrimination of letters is, is, uh, is harder. And basically, your task is only to look for X's or N's. Press a button, left button, if you see an X around there, and press the right button if you see an N in the circle. And sometimes there's a flank, an additional stimulus, which can be neutral or it can be a distractor. It could be an X or N. If there is an X over here and X is displayed over there, then that's congruent. And your responses actually get a bit faster. If it's an N and there's an X, you need to press the left button. You get you, you slow down a bit because this one distracts you and so you, you want to press the, the other button. It slows you down but only in the low perceptual load condition which means that you process the distractor even if you have you're told to ignore but in the high load condition there's no distraction because it's not processed. The flanker is not processed. So that's, that's uh, one way to, 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 to show how the perceptual load condition uh, affects the, uh, the response speed, your selection speed. Now, what happens in, if the working memory, lo uh, memory load is high? The opposite happens. You get more, distra uh, more distraction in the high memory load condition. For example, this is a low uh, working memory load. You're shown a screen with one digit. Remember that one 
we're going to ask you whether the, the, in the last screen the same letter, uh, the uh, digit was displayed or not. And then they do the tracking task again. And the same thing for high me working memory load condition. And you can see that the distraction is higher, the, the larger the, the higher the bar in the high load condition indicates that there's 61 millisecond slowing down in the high working memory load condition, but only 35 milliseconds in the low working memory condition, as if the distractor is processed less when the working memory is, is really working hard. Sorry, working hard. So there are, there are no resources to process the distractor. Okay, so that's what Lobby suggested. Now, uh, what we did was we modified the flanker task. Let's see if I have. Oh, yeah. Think about at what processing stage attention can have an effect, selective attention can have an effect on audiovisual integration. Some people say, no, it's completely automatic. You cannot tamper the integration process by manipulating uh, selective attention. So that's, there's no attentional effect. Some people say that yes, it affects extraction of visual features. And then it hampers the audiovisual uh, feature integration because there are no visual features to, to combine with the auditory features. And some people say that, no, it truly affects the actual integration process. Because this is the, the, the interesting uh, option. Because if you don't, um, if the system doesn't get any information about visual features, then it's the same thing as you close your eyes and just listen. Unless you can show that visual features are extracted, but then attention just affects the actual integration. At the moment, nobody knows which, uh, where the effect comes from. I believe in this one. I don't have very strong evidence for that, but there are a couple of nice papers which show that uh, the visual features affect the way you are uh, processing stimuli, although you're not really even uh, aware that you process them. Right, okay, um, let's go. Right, that's Vicky, and that's not a nose ring, it's just uh, a circle which indicates where we put the, uh, the target character. Now, we wanted to avoid numbers and letters because we're dealing with audio-visual speech perception and those are sort of linguistic stimuli. So we had to come up with some, some other types of characters which are not familiar to people, you know, at least uh, Westerners. And what Nili Labi suggested is that, why don't you use Hebrew letters? Because at least for me, Hebrew letters are just visual graphical characters, and they made no sense to me. And what we did was, uh, we had two conditions. One where there were either one of the two characters, Hebrew characters, the targets, and then just five dots. So it was really easy to pick up the, which one of those. And we consider that the mouth is the distractor. Now, if people are looking at, fixating at the middle of the nose and doing the tracking task, and then on one, each trial we ask what you heard. This one actually, like if you remember from, uh, from, uh, from the earlier, the first demonstration where Vicky says, Abba, Abba, then there's a silence about three seconds at first. And then during that task, people are doing the tracking task. And they're still doing what, well, Vicky actually pronounces the, the, uh, the, the word, the syllable. 
And then after the, the trial, we ask, what did you hear? They say, Abba, Ada, or Aga. And now, if the tracking task depletes the attentional resources, then people would be more inclined to say what was coming out from the loudspeakers. Abba, when Vicky was actually pronouncing Abba, as if visual information didn't affect the integration process. The low load condition, just one target and five dots, easy task. And the other one where there were three, uh, three uh, non-targets, Hebrew uh, letters, which were really, I mean, to me it was just too much. I couldn't do it with, you know, we had to slow down the presentation rate so that other people felt that it was ridiculous. How can you be so slow? But uh, we did with, uh, with, uh, with students, college students, and they were, some of them were really fast and accurate. Anyway, so a similar type of, of idea, oh, sorry, audiovisual baseline, just the Hebrew letters displayed, but the task was just to focus your attention on the mouth and report what you heard. That's the baseline, the reference. Then low load, same stimuli, the audiovisual stimuli, but now the easy target task. And then the high load and a couple of control conditions just uh, to show that they can actually listen to the auditory only or the videos, but they can lip read immaculately. Okay? And now, this is the baseline. Again, percentage of correctly reported auditory stimuli. And the higher the bar, again, less integration happens. In this case, the baseline, only 8.8% of the, of the trials, people just reported the auditory parts. 92%, in 92% cases, they said a fusion response or some, some other non-auditory uh, response. Okay, now that's the baseline, and this is the low load condition, that's the high load condition. Almost on half of the trials, people said what was coming out of the loudspeakers. So no integration on half of the trials. So a huge effect, attentional effect again. But no indication that the load, perceptual load, actually affected the, the results. Now we've... Uh, run a few control, uh, control exper experiments because we had a still video and sometimes, you know, if the mouse starts to talk suddenly, that can capture attention, just a pop-up, so that they, they start look, paying attention to, to the mouse, although they should be doing the task, the visual task. Now we control for that, the mouth was moving throughout from the beginning, exactly the same results more or less. And there may be two explanations for that. The high load condition is a bit too uh, difficult for, for, for the subjects. So they cannot keep track there. So, and they automatically pay attention. Their resources are not depleted. And they pay attention to the moving mouth, although they are asked to ignore it. Or that this speech and faces are specific stimuli for, for human beings. So the face processing and speech processing are to some extent so automatic, so human being like, that you cannot help but process the stuff. There is an attentional effect, but it's not as Lavie's theory suggests. Now, we're thinking about these different options, and, but at the moment there is no clear answer to this dilemma. Okay, finally, let's see what we've got. Um, right, uh, this is just a summary of the, of the results. So, I strongly believe that focus attention is uh, a significant prerequisite for audiovisual integration. You need to pay attention, not look at the map, but you need to pay attention to 
to the mouth of this. If you don't pay, the McGurk effect is reduced. And again, we don't know whether people were actually paying attention to the mouth, although we strongly uh, forbid them. that. Okay, now just stick to the Hebrew letters. But they still could have done it. Uh, I don't know how to how to test that. Actually, how to control for that? Yeah, because it's just something if you have Hebrew letters on the nose as you did, and then have them on the mouth, like here. Yeah, so you have them focused attention on the same area, but yeah, on yeah, a different yeah. object. Yeah. Whereas here you might be having in both attention and awareness. Yeah. Here yeah, that's that's a good point. It, 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 it will blur the, the mouth movements. Yes, yeah, so a bit. You can probably come up with a good set of colors. And yeah, shape. and you can control for you know the lip reading thing. If the lip reading accuracy is reduced, then we know that the Hebrew letters actually um, affect lip reading performance. But still, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, now, right. Um, so, just a few names here. Uh, Tobias and Kosper work in, in, uh, in Copenhagen. These are my students, and then that's the, uh, that's the uh, um, Helsinki University of Technology where I did my postdoc. I came up with this sign wave speech idea. Although Mikko Sons didn't like it, but we did. Okay, I guess that's it. Sorry, say again. The, we know that you showed some cortical areas. Yeah, the subcortical. What about subcortical? Um, no, but what I know is that uh, uh, motor areas are, in many cases, the brocus area is activated. But it looks like the brocus area is not required for integration. And it, you, you probably know uh, Wille Oyanis, you know, the fMRI work, which shows activation in the Broca's area, but it doesn't really provide you the timing information. You could integrate uh, the visual and auditory stimuli, which then inform the motor areas for response preparation or, or something else. But, you know, uh, MEG, EEG results don't show a frontal activation. Yeah, the other question, the awareness. awareness. Yeah, um, I would, the way I see the relationship between attention and awareness is that you need attention to become aware. But you, if, even if you're paying attention, you don't, may not be aware. But I cannot envision, uh, you know, a situation where you're aware, but you haven't really paid attention. Or, do you have data? Yeah, you're aware of the traffic outside, but you don't pay attention to it. You could hear it, you were, you're concentrating on the talk instead. But every once in a while you pay attention to it. To be aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You might be right. And you, you, you sort of check that the, the harm is still there. And then you, you, I would say, you kind of fool yourself and think, okay, I have been aware of it all the time. Or well, in your experiment, you are, you are fully aware of the male talker being in the background, but you are completely ignoring and paying attention to the female. Uh, yeah, that's, that's... But again, at least when, when I listen to, to, to the two talkers, I pay attention to the, to 
through the mail every once in a while. You know, I get distracted. And then I just collect myself and focus on the female. But there, there are two different things, attention and awareness. Any other questions? Everything is crystal clear.